Welcome to the Functional Medicine Doc Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kurt Wohler, talking with experts in functional and integrative health and medicine, discussing critical information for improving your health and wellness to help you live a long, full life. Let's get to it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Functional Medicine Doc Talk Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Kurt Wohler, and this is a an area uh, of information, this program where we get into various topics of functional and integrated medicine that also includes many topics on health and wellness. So I'm very excited about this program today. I'm going to introduce you to a longtime friend and colleague, Lori Knowles. And Lori heads up a highly respected supplement company that I've been working with for many years called New Beginnings Nutritionals. And she is also a mom of a son recovered from autism. So, Lori, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Kurt. It's great to be here. So, I thought what we'd do is we want to talk about your work in autism and, you know, tips and suggestions and things like that that you have seen over the years and, of course, your work with New Beginnings. But before doing that, give us a little background just on yourself. In going back, you know, years personally and professionally, and what you were doing prior to your son being diagnosed. Okay. Well, um, once I graduated from college, I got I was working on Capitol Hill since I lived in the D.C. area, and I was working on one of the congressional committees. And I was a political science French major, <laughs> and um, I ended up getting into computers and learning about computers. And then I got married. And my husband was transferred to Kansas City. And I ended up um, pretty much not working. And I ended up having four children. And I was a full-time mom. And my youngest uh, son, Daniel, uh, was diagnosed with autism at age two and a half. And that sort of changed the whole trajectory of my life. And what year was that? That was... About 2003. Okay. And I had three other children before him, and they, you know, were typical. Um, There was no autism. So this came at a huge surprise. And so I'm actually showing uh, some pictures here of Daniel when he was very, very young. And then you can tell us about the uh, the other image here, too. Yes. And so the picture on the left is his two-year-old birthday, where he was so out of it. He couldn't even notice the candle or blow it out. I had to bring it up to his face to even show it. And he did not have the capacity to blow it out. He was not aware that it was his birthday. And uh, he's a little bit younger to the picture on the right. And it that glassy stare, that open mouth, constant drooling that he did. Um, He was just in his own world and really not any language, not aware of what was going on around him, you know, difficult to understand what we were saying to him. And that image of him on the right is, I have seen pictures of that for going back 25 years now with my involvement. It's it's so characteristic of young yeah. children such as him, you know, who just... You can tell by the eyes. Yeah. 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 The yeah. eyes say it all. So what was, I'm curious, what was that like as you look back at that time, getting that diagnosis? Um, It was devastating. It was like my whole world ended. I think I went into like a depression for about a week. And I ended up recognizing that I had to do something and not just be in the space of being depressed. Um, So I took that negative energy and I funneled into doing research to figuring out what I could do for him, if anything. And thankfully, I'd had a a, a, a speech therapist give me a copy of Dr. Shaw's book, Biomedical Treatments for Autism and PDD. And I'd sort of set it aside, but this was my time. I picked it up and I just devoured it. And, and, for, those, and for those listeners who don't know who Dr. Shaw is, maybe you can get a little background on who he is and uh, was back then uh, and how you actually found found him and his work. Dr. William Shaw is a PhD biochemist who has has been doing research and um, looking into, I mean, he worked for the the CDC at one point for Smith-Klein Laboratories, and he ended up 
coming out to Kansas City and working with uh, uh, Children's Mercy Hospital, and he discovered uh, abnormalities in the urine of children with autism, and it just set him on this trajectory of this is what he wanted his life goal to be, to try to find out underlying reasons for autism and have an effect to change what was going on with the autism epidemic to find a, a solution, a cure if, per se for that. And so he got involved with Defeat Autism Now movement, which was the beginning of the biomedical movement for autism, you know, begun by Bernie Rimland. He was a big part of that, a speaker. And then he was one of the first ones to generate a book that discussed all the things that are going on medically underneath um, underlying things that affect children on the spectrum that actually cause their symptoms. And so um, he, he founded the Great Plains Laboratory, which is one of the most well-known laboratories in the world. Um, people send their testing from all over the world and, and they are very well respected. They recently uh, changed their name to Mosaic Diagnostics. But I read in his book about all the things that could be going on with my son, like yeast and bacteria. And he talked about food allergies and he talked about toxins. Um, he talked about um, um, ways to treat these kids and uh, the research that he had done. And it just lit a fire under me. And I was like, I'm going to find a way to do whatever I can to help my son. And, and of course, diet was another one, which um, you really, you know, all this stuff as a mom and people are telling you it could be this, it could be that, and you have to change the diet. And that means take away the only foods that he's eating, which is a scary thought because kids on the spectrum are very picky and they only sometimes eat five things. But he gave me the reasons in this book to go for it. And I did. And it was really... Um, it was really what I needed. And I started on my journey at that point and started doing things on my own and, you know, then had to reach out and connect with the doctor. So going back many years, so Dr. Shaw was really my first introduction to what we call biomedical intervention for autism. In fact, I saw him speak at one of the Defeat Autism Now conferences in San Diego, California at the time where I was practicing. And it was sponsored by the Autism Research Institute, headed up by Dr. Rimlin. Mm -hmm. And I still remember Shaw speaking. And in fact, pretty much the only thing I remember about that conference, and that was late 90s, was something about an organic acid test uh, or, or these different compounds that are showing up in the urine of certain kids with autism. So it was it was Dr. Shaw that I first consulted with when I actually did a lab test to say, well, what does all this stuff mean? And he actually recommended I uh, put a child on nystatin, which is an antifungal and a gluten casein free diet and some other supplements. And it, and it worked, you know, significantly for this particular child. So it's interesting. It, it's, we, we kind of came, I, maybe I was a little bit earlier than you, as far as, you know, when, when Daniel was diagnosed, but Right around that similar time, our introductions to Dr. Shaw and his work with Great Plains. So, and then I've been, as you know, been working with Great Plains for years and now with Mosaic Diagnostics. So, so that's great. So from, so you, you get involved and I'm assuming you did some lab, lab testing early on. And did you find well, well, in, that, yes. in all the things that Shaw was, that was, Shaw was talking yeah. about? Yes. I mean, it's interesting because you still can't believe and buy into the fact that your kid has these issues. You're thinking other kids might have these issues, but not mine. And then when you do the lab testing, it just, right. I mean, I was blown away. I mean, he had so many food allergies. He had three or four different types of pathogenic yeast. He had bacteria, pathogenic bacteria. His gut was a mess. I mean, I was an absolute shock, but the lab testing is so important for the parents because it really shows you how sick they are and it gives you a roadmap of what to do to how to start treatments. And so this is Daniel now, I'm assuming, now. sometime recently. Yeah, now. this is a couple of years ago and he graduated from uh, uh, KU 
And he had an IT degree, and this was his graduation and his graduation pictures, and he is living on his own. And he's working in the IT field and very successful. I mean, his employers love him, and he lives with a friend, and he's completely independent. Awesome. That is amazing, amazing transformation. So, you know, Lori, when you look back, when you think about when you started, and let's go through some of the steps that you went through in those early days, and maybe some of the key interventions that were helpful for Daniel. Uh, and really kind of maybe the time frame. I, it, a lot of people come and they think, well, this might only take a few months or, you know, six months or nine months. And we know it can take a lot longer than that. Um, but, you know, give us a little background on sort of the sort of the beginning steps, some of the key interventions that you did and what kind of progress you saw and sort of a reasonable maybe time frame that that looking back now with yourself, with Daniel and other people that you've consulted with, you know, what can parents expect? Well, one of the first things I tell parents is this is a marathon and it's not a sprint. And you have got to, um, you know, we're so used to quick, fast food, fast answers, take one pill and you get better and you're done within a week or two. And this is not that situation. Um, Autism can be extremely complex. Some children are more complicated, have more underlying issues than others. So as a parent, you have to, first of all, get in a mindset that you're willing to do whatever it takes um, and start peeling back the layers of the onion, as an example, to start figuring out how how to get them better. The first thing I did was diet. I started diet on my own after reading his book and kind of going online and doing research. And I did it all wrong. (laughs) I took all the food away and I didn't research how to substitute it. And so, you know, he was crying, wanting to eat. And I was opening up my, uh, my cupboard saying, what am I going to feed him? And having a where you're saying, and where you're saying you took away food, which types of food? Well, I all dairy and wheat was where I got started. And so, um, and I eventually figured out, okay, this is a substitute for the Wheaties eating, and this is a substitute for the dairy. And I started, um, I did everything at once. Sometimes it makes sense to just do one at a time, first take away the wheat and then the dairy or dairy, then wheat. But but the reality is, is once I got these foods out of his diet, within a couple weeks, he started Going, he started talking in sentences where his language was completely uh, just not there. He might have said, you know, um, he might have said something like no or yes, but he never answered, you know, questions. And it's just, it's like his brain just opened up and he was aware. And it was just amazing. The speech therapist was dumbfounded to see what was happening with him. Literally two weeks for him. And, um, and the progress started getting better with other things. And so I was really excited. I'm like, okay, th- what next? But to me, when a parent with autism comes to me and says, what do I do? I, the first thing is, is diet, you know, and it's a lot easier to do gluten casein free right now than it was way back then when I oh, was yeah. starting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many more options now. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, that, and, and that, by the way, is something I've seen. So it's, it's a consistent intervention that helps. Usually, as you mentioned, it's best to do things one at a time, you know, a dairy, you know, then gluten or vice versa, but uh, extremely, extremely helpful. So that's, that, that's what I expected. I'm, I mean, you know, we've talked mm-hmm. before, but usually dietary intervention comes up very high in the list of things to do. So where did you go from there? So you, you're working with diet, and I'm assuming at some point you start incorporating various supplements, which, you know, there's, that's yeah. been an evolving science over the years. So yeah, where yes. did you go from there? Well, I tried some supplements. Um, and I, and I, um, first of all, I did all this before we had a diagnosis because it was taking six months to get in, to get a diagnosis. But I suspected that he had autism and I was pretty sure that that was going to be what his diagnosis would be, but I didn't want to wait. You know, I heard the sooner you start, the earlier, the better. Sometimes the more progress and faster progress you can get. So I started all of this um, on my own. And um, 
there was a couple supplements that I tried. Um, some of the first ones that I started were like a, a multivitamin that was designed for autism. And, um, and I really honestly, you know, I'm not a stuff. I was not a supplement person. I did not take supplements myself. And so I didn't have a lot of expectations that they would help him, but I was really surprised when I started on a good multi and added fish oil, actually it was cod liver oil, he, his cognition got better. He was calmer. He was more focused and eye contact increased significantly. And so I realized that there were so many deficiencies from eating inadequately for so long. And and even when you put them on special diets, there could be, you know, major nutrients that are not, that are lacking. You know, for example, wheat has a lot of B vitamins in them and, and you take away wheat and, and are you getting enough B vitamins? So these children need it. And I was really surprised with the, be- the benefits that, that came from just adding supplements. So that was another layer of him getting better. So one of the things that I often talk about with these foundational supplements, and we've talked about this as well, is I I call that filling in the holes or filling in the gaps nutritionally, right? Yes, optimally, we want to try to work towards a real food, whole food diet, but many of these kids either are not on it because of texture issues or sensory issues or because they're poor absorption, whatever it may be. And so multivitamins, minerals, essential fats are, are key elements in getting in there to just to fill in those gaps. And a real interesting thing about the cod liver oil, uh, when I was wondering about his eye contact, because there's a lot of research that goes back many years, specifically about cod liver oil in helping with the visual system through different receptors in the eyes that help to properly transfer visual information to the visual cortex in the brain. And it specifically has to do with the natural vitamin A. So uh, yeah. And by the way, I just want to jump in on that, Kurt. He did a lot of the side glancing. He would hold a toy up and he would look at it out of the corner of his eyes. And we would go, this is really weird. Why is he using his peripheral vision to check something out? Right. And after doing cod liver oil, that completely disappeared. Yeah. And that was part of their, that was part of Mary Mixon's um, research. Right. Yeah, that exactly. That's, that's, that's great. Well, I'm, you know, I'll let you continue, Lori. I, I mean, I'm assuming that you also then sort of moving into different lab testing. Yes. Which I'm well, going to assume no. was the organic acid test at some point. But, well, uh, the but organic go on, acid yeah. test was the first test we did, and okay. it showed a lot of a lot of pathogenic yeast, and it showed a lot of nutritional deficiencies. It showed um, mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, my child was very low tone. He was a couch potato and he didn't like to move around. So that is a, a something that can be very typical. It's not with every child with autism, but that is something that a good percentage of them are dealing with. So, so those, when you get those lab tests, those markers said that he needed carnitine, L-carnitine. And so when we started giving him L-carnitine, for that mitochondrial dysfunction, um, his energy got better, you know, and his muscle tone increased. And so those were some of the supplements. And we started treating the yeast and the bacteria. And we tried, um, we started with nystatin. And I was amazed because one of my thing is a lot of these kids have yeast. Yeast is a big issue. And It's hard to know what yeast looks like in your child. And a lot of children show yeast symptoms differently. Like for some kids, they're up laughing in the middle of the night, you know, and and waking up and laughing for no apparent reason. Sometimes they can, as you say, giddy, goofy, silly, right? And then there's um, Daniel was very stinny when, you know, and his language, when he was talking, he would be more hard to understand and he would tend to drool more and he would do more visual stems when his yeast was high. So we started Nystatin and we saw a really good benefit. But the problem was, is that Nystatin only worked for three months and then it stopped working. The yeast is a very smart organism and it learns how to work around what you're giving it. And so it quit working. And so we had to find other solutions at that point. What about, you mentioned bacteria. One of the things the organic acid test picks up on is 
general metabolites of dysbiosis, which is imbalance of bacteria in the digestive tract, but also various clostridia bacteria. So did he have any of the clostridia markers? He did. He did have clostridia and we had a really tough time getting on top of it. And there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more information about treating clostridia effectively that wasn't available way back then, but we ended yeah. up using a different combination of specialized uh, probiotics for that ended up working. It actually Saccharomyces boulardii actually did it for us eventually. Um, but the clostridia was a big deal. And when they have clostridia, they can be very, very angry and act out and very moody. And, and it kind of takes over your child and makes them not like them, their own self. I mean, it's like, a, like somebody's come and taken over your kid's body because it does make them react differently. And so getting hold of that and treating that was so important. So we did that. But the other thing we did, Kurt, is we did a comprehensive stool analysis. Okay. And when we did that, they were able to culture. He had four different types of pathogenic bacteria, including Klebsiella. And uh, there was um, a couple other ones. I can't remember all of them, but we ended up looking at what the natural uh, treatment for that was like we did Uva Ursi and Uva Ursi not only was able to get rid of some of those pathogenic species of bacteria, but also the, the yeast as well. So that's the beauty of the, the uh, comp stool is it does the, um, um, uh, they, they match it against different substances, both pharmaceutical and supplement, dietary supplements, and you can choose one that will work. So that was helpful for us. And it also showed me that his his gut was an absolute mess. Yeah, the comprehensive digestive stool tests are very important. I, I look at, they complement the organic acid test, but the organic acid test complements the complementary digestive stool test. And so both are very powerful tools. I'm curious, Lori, one of the things that I've seen, I first learned this many years ago with a child who had the typical yeast candida behavior, the goofiness, giddiness, silliness, as you described, a lot of self-stimulatory behavior. And so I'm like, okay, so let's do some nice stat. So it was interesting because we actually had, uh, no, actually, I think we it was actually just basing it on symptoms, which was a mistake at that time. But mm -hmm. I did nice statin and fully expecting him to get a resolution of those problems. Instead, within three days, he went through a Jekyll and Hyde transformation. He went from goofy, giddy, silly, inappropriate laughter to angry, irritable, hitting his head against the wall. And I thought, uh-oh, we have a problem. And, but I, I knew enough at that time, this is many years ago, to think this seems more like a bacterial problem, a clostridia problem. So I turned around, got him off the nice stat, and I just was trying to act quickly. I actually put him on Flagyl, which is an antibiotic for Clostridia, and it transformed him in 48 hours. And sure enough, later on, he ended up manifesting with Clostridia on the organic acid test. And so I was wondering with Daniel, did you get any sort of that Jekyll and Hyde phenomena when you put him on nice statin early on? Um, you know, after or maybe nystatin, the clostridia showed up later or something. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's true. And after nystatin stopped working, they tried Spornox. And um, Spornox, you can't go on very long because it'll it'll affect your liver if you keep on it for more than a few weeks. And so the die-off was really significantly bad for, for Spornox. And then once I stopped it, the yeast came back uh, with a vengeance. And I believe it also at that point allowed the clostridia to take over as well, because in our body, in our GI tracts, our yeast and our pathogenic bacteria are competing for space. And so when you go in with one, um, you go in with an antifungal and you're trying to cheat treat the yeast, it, it will kill that yeast, but then the, 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 the pathogenic bacteria then will, will sort of take over. That's how I was, you know, it's not a very technical term and a technical way to describe it, Kurt, but, but that's basically what I heard is what happens. And so it's a good idea when you're treating yeast to also be giving something that will help keep 
a pathogenic bacteria like Clostridia at bay. Yeah, and those are strategies that you know have evolved over time too. And you have many products through New Beginnings Nutritionals to help combat that, whether it's the yes. combination of botanicals or different mm-hmm. you know soil-based organisms. Uh, and this new oregano uh, product, I know that Dr. Shaw has been mentioning and you've been mentioning as well. So we go through diet. You're now treating gut. You've assessed the gut. It's a mess, which it usually is with so many kids. And you're obviously continuing the diet. You've incorporated some foundational supplements, filling in those gaps. Uh, the organic acid test was pivotal. The comprehensive digestive t- stool test was critical. Where did you go from there? Where, where else? I mean, we're going back many years, and so I have an idea, but uh, where, where did things, you know, um, move from that point? Okay. Well, you're also challenging my memory. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, we looked at toxicities at that point. And back then, the big emphasis was heavy metals. Yeah. Um, they weren't looking at mold, at mycotoxins, which is a big deal now. They were not looking at glyphosate and pesticides and those types of chemicals, but they were testing our kids for heavy metals. And um, the hair test was important for that. And my son had a significant amount of heavy metals in his body. So um, which ones? arsenic and aluminum okay. were the highest. Um, the other things were, you know, he met the counting rules for mercury, even though it didn't show up on the test. But this is the end. So we were looking at the Andy Cutler protocol. And we did about six months of low dose DMSA, and we gave it every four hours, uh, three days on, seven days off. And, you know, and I know there's other protocols out there for treating heavy metals, but that was the one that I went with back then. And I could not believe the difference in my son after we finished every round of chelation. How many rounds did you do, by the way? I'm just curious. How many rounds did you end up doing? Just an estimate. We did every other weekend for six months. So that would be 12 rounds. Right, right, right. And it it was very weird, Kurt, because he was wearing a diaper. He was only three when I started this. And right after we started, I started seeing these little metallic specks in his bowel, in his stool. And they were just... I mean, it was like, what is going on? And, you know, we we were barely making it financially. So I didn't have the money to send it off and have, have it tested. Yeah. But after the first three or four rounds, it dissipated and it completely disappeared. So the only thing I can think about is that it was pulling something and putting it into the stool. And I never was able to find out what it was. And I wish I could have. But all I knew is that he was getting better after every single round. And um, by the time we had done six months, we were not seeing any improvement when we were treating him for the metals and trying to pull them out. So we stopped at that time. And um, that was, you know, our experience with uh, detoxification for metals. So at this point, what, are you nine months into this, a year into this process. It it normally takes for parents to kind of get going with a diet, you know, a month or two and then supplements and then antifungals. And what, you know, I know I'm making you go back in time, but I'm just, are we sort of about a year into this process? Would you think? I would say a year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was, I mean, I'm more of a type A person. So when I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it as quickly as possible in a safe way, but I was, you know, I ended up finding a doctor. Um, Actually, we traveled, took him on an airplane, went down to see her um, because she was well-known and respected. And I wanted to find someone that had experience with treating kids with autism, especially with chelation, which to me was kind of scary to do. And I wanted to work with somebody who had experience. So um, we just, started following with her directions and she helped us along. And I had a local doctor here that I worked with that was helping me with running some lab tests and stuff, just, you know, his his vitals and his, you know, his CBCs and things like that, checking for liver function and that type of thing. So we just kept going. And, you know, I think over a period of two years, 
Um, I added some ABA in there to try to help him catch up on his skills that he was way behind in. And I think, you know, and I was also very much involved with being the therapist 24 seven, constantly challenging him to look at me, to use his words, to focus on his environment. I mean, I was one of those moms that, you know, I was going to come at him from all angles to do whatever I could to help him get well. And I wasn't sure if he would recover, but I knew that he was going to be getting better. And I saw him getting better. So I just kept going. As you long also as knew I that could. if you did, did nothing, not that much was going to happen. So, yes, you know, exactly. so Lori, before I want, I want to kind of talk about your work with New Beginnings and, 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 and some of the things there. And then I'm, I'll come back and ask you a few things about, you know, tips and suggestions for kids with doing supplements and, um, you know, as we, we sort of wrap up our discussion. But I, I, I forgot to ask you what, what happened with Daniel? At least, you know, when you look back in time, did were, were there issues that you recognized shortly after birth? Did he have typical development for a period of time and then regress? You know, I know, again, it's going back many years, but what is your suspicion of things that triggered this, this uh, autistic uh, diagnosis for him? Yeah. Of course, I didn't recognize it at the time, but now that I look back, um, I am convinced that that he was reacting to the vaccines that he was getting. When he got um, his early vaccines, um, you know, before a year, um, you know, I, I, he started having um, skin problems, you know, rosacea, um, uh, bright red spots all over his body, you know, little pimple looking things. And then he um, also uh, started his tone. He couldn't regularly crawl. So he would do the army man crawl where he didn't use his legs at all. And, um, but he, but he was developing normally beside those things um, where I saw with the, with the floppy low tone and the skin issues but when he had his 15 month vaccines, which included the MMR, at that point, within a few weeks of that, those vaccine series, that vaccine series that he got, he ended up uh, losing all language because he could say no, yes, uh, mommy, daddy, uh, please. I mean, all of that went away and he yeah. wasn't able to, to, yeah. to do that anymore. And he just went into his own world and no longer seem to care about things around him or focusing on anything in his environment and got real repetitive and, and cranky and couldn't transition well and all of that. And that just happened slowly over time. He wasn't one of those kids that got seizures immediately upon being vaccinated. I mean, those kids, you know, right away what it is, but when it happens kind of slowly over time, you don't always catch it and don't realize what's going on when you're in the middle of it. Yeah, I've, I've sat here for over 25 years and heard same or similar stories. You know, it, it's it's very, and, and these are parents all over the world. Um, so real quickly, and then we'll, we'll talk about your work with New Beginnings. So, you know, he's graduated college, he's off in his life. So real intense, a lot of work early on, two years or so. At what point in his life, did you, at what age approximately, did you feel like, hey, we're past this or we've moved beyond this crisis situation where he was, or did he officially get his autistic diagnosis removed or did that just sort of fade away? What, you know, a, a general time frame might, and what you've mentioned up front, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And so usually there's a, you know, a two or three year time frame for, for some kids. What was, what was the, uh, how did it work with Daniel? So late elementary school, they came to me and said, Daniel doesn't need an IEP anymore. Okay. And I was like, what? Because <laughs> you depend on that IEP and it's scary to have it taken away. Um, but that was my first indication that, you know, he may be one of those kids that can be called recovered. Um, and then he, so I was still doing the diet. I mean, we did the diet, Kurt, strictly for nine years. Uh, he, I, I gave, I, he hardly ever, there was one time where he got waffles 
that were wheat based because I bought the wrong one and I fed them to him and he had this awful regression and he started being just like he used to be. And it just freaked me out, but it sure did convince me that he needed the diet. So we got over that. It took about a week or two to recover completely to be back where he was baseline before he ate that offending food. But then we kept going with the diet all the way through elementary school. And then he goes into middle school. And at this point, he's acting pretty typical, right? People don't look at him and go, oh, that kid has autism. And he wanted to fit in. And so, you know, he was begging. He started eating, cheating, throwing away his enzymes at school. Lunch lady would call me and go, I just saw Daniel throw away his enzymes into the trash can. And so I had to, I had at that point, I, I just, I had to just give up. So we did digestive enzymes, the Houston enzymes, which are known to, 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 to help with the effects of wheat and dairy on some kids. And so he seemed like he was doing well. And then he just stopped doing everything. I couldn't get his pills in him, his supplements. And he was, uh, I just sort of sat back and saw what happened and nothing happened. And I think not every kid can do this. And I'm not saying every child will be able to go off the diet or go off the supplements and still be okay. But Daniel was able to. And um, I'm not, you know, and he still has anxiety, you know, as an adult off and on. It's not like he is 100%, you know, without problems or issues, but um people would never see autism in him. And um, sometimes he comes to me and asks me for something like, mom, I think I need more of that magnesium or, you know, so it's just, it's, I mean, overall though, he's, you know, he, I, he probably eats like crap as a 25 year old boy, uh, adult. He, I can't control that, but he's yeah. holding his own own. And so that's, obviously what we want you can't control them for the rest of your life exactly and eventually you got him to a point where he had to make his had, has to make his own decisions and and, and you welcome that right mm -hmm. that's where you want to get with this because people ask me it's like well how long do they have to continue the supplements for the rest of their life and i said well you know we don't know but in reality if these things work early on and you get after it early on and, you know, put a good two, three years into this process, which that mm -hmm. time frame is going to go, it's going to occur anyway. You know, you're going to get to the point, you know, with many kids, and we're certainly not saying all, but many that they're going to have to make their own choices as they get older. You're not going to have mm -hmm. control. And that's what you want as a parent. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to have to be completely in control of my son or my daughter's life. And so that's kind of where Daniel is. So, you know, I mean, Lori, it's, it's an amazing story. And I mean, I've heard you tell that story before in lectures and um, in other interviews and whatnot. I, I forgot some of the details, you know, of, of some of the things, but um, you know, like so many parents out there, you are, you know, that, that example of a, an individual who is their tenacity to move through this process and it certainly isn't that you didn't have questions or concerns, but you just kept moving and researching and pushing. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, congratulations, congratulations to Daniel and, and your family and, and for, for you. moving through this. So mm -hmm. tell us about New Beginnings. What, how did you get involved? What is it? What services you provide? Uh, and I'll certainly fill in too, because I've been using you guys for so many years, but uh, what led to that? So I, when I started working with Daniel and I had read Dr. Shaw's books, uh, I met somebody who was going to be working at the lab and she was encouraging me to try to <clears throat> see if um, I could get a job working with Dr. Shaw. So um, I had a couple interviews with him and I finally convinced him to hire me. And I started with um, helping him edit the second edition of his new book. And then once I finished with that one, um, he said, I want you to help me start a company. And I said, okay, I will give it all I have. And so I started New Beginnings Nutritionals. And we initially were going to start it to be focused in Mexico. And then we realized that that didn't work very well with just the way they do business down there. And so we decided to make it uh, a U.S. company. 
And um, we just began with a few products and started expanding. And it's been, it's been, uh, you know, I was able to use my experience as a mom and the supplements that I knew work, as well as what I looked at in the research, as well as doctors who we've reached out to. Dr. Shaw as himself knew supplements that children needed on the autistic spectrum. And we were looking at DMG and TMG and all the supplements that we knew were helping them with methylation and helping them with the nutrient deficiencies. And children with autism have special supplement needs. And so we were really focused on coming up with a product line that was going to cover a good percentage, if not the majority of problems and symptoms and issues that they have. Um, including, um, you know, with detox and digestion and and um, anxiety, brain support. And so we really kind of began building it. And we started with like 10 products and now we have like 170. And we carry our own products as well as the best of other people. We're like a one-stop shop and we bring in a you know, people love a particular product that's working, we bring it in and make it available at the same price as if you go to that website to get it, you know, so that was our goal, is creating a really wonderful product line that the parents felt comfortable with that they could trust. And we make sure that whatever we carry is efficacious and pure, uh, tested for toxins, heavy metals, um, pathogens, um, so that people know um, and are comfortable with it. And we provide the additional support that a lot of companies don't do. The hand-holding, we answer the questions, we support parents who reach out and say, you know, can you help me with these questions? My child is doing X, Y, and Z. And so we support them the best way we can to help them and give them um, support. And that's one of the things that I have recognized and appreciated for so many years in just being busy in clinical practice, you know, and making supplement, you know, supplement recommendations. I can't, I can't give the supplements to a child. I'm relying on the parent, you know, to do that and to learn how to do that and to figure it out. And one of the things about your company I've always appreciated is the support that you provide. It's a huge benefit to a practitioner such as myself. And so that leads me to my next question. First, the core issues, right? We, we know that we have language problems. We have stereotypical behavioral issues. We have social issues. In your, I guess you're looking back with Daniel and, and then working with parents through new beginnings, what are sort of the, the top three or maybe top five core issues that most autistic special needs kids are dealing with from a let's just call it a biological or a biomedical standpoint that you sort of expect or look to see can be helped through foundational supplementation. Well, we do know that somehow their digestive processes get thrown off and they're not able to break down typical proteins like gluten and dairy, uh, the proteins in gluten and dairy, which is uh, uh, wheat and dairy, gluten and casein. And so they need help with digestion. They're not absorbing their food. Their GI tracts are inflamed and they're a mess. And so it's very important to look at making sure that they're digesting food properly, looking at reducing the inflammation in their GI tract. And again, that can be helped with supplements. Um, but it also has helped with taking away the, the problematic foods that are causing inflammation and, and eliminating those from the diet. But you also can help the GI tract heal by giving probiotics, good bacteria to take over and help push out the bad and to help the body to, to, to start colonizing probi uh, good bacteria that is so desperately needed and often lacking in these kids. And then Supplements are what helped my son finally get over the yeast issues, uh, the natural botanical extracts, which we rotated on a continual basis to prevent the yeast from coming back, from building resistance. 
So I found from my own experience that rotating natural supplements such as oregano oil, such as um, uh, caprylic acid or, or MCT oil, grapefruit seed extract, um, garlic, those types of natural antimicrobials were way more effective and in the long term helped my son finally beat that yeast beast that we were fighting for so many years. Now, when you're saying rotation, is that, are you using one at a time? One at a time every week. Every week. So one, one, moving from one natural remedy, one botanical individually every seven days or so. Correct. Okay. Correct. Gotcha. Because okay. the research that I had looked at showed that that if an organism is going to become resistant, it tends to start happening after seven days. And so that's why we set that time frame at seven days. So when I started doing that and I started treating Daniel's yeast in this way, um, and then I would stop and see how he was doing. And as long as I wasn't giving him a lot of sugary foods, a uh, lot of carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, he would do well. And then like Halloween would come and he would get into some Halloween candy. And then I could see the symptoms of yeast starting to uh, show itself again. And right. then I would start oregano oil again, for, like for example. And I was able to keep on top of it and push it down um, and keep it in control. And so that was what I did that finally worked for my son. And so supplements gave me the um, the power to help him. And it took years. I mean, literally he was not, his yeast did not go under control and the immune system wasn't able to keep it under control by itself. It took two, three years, maybe four even of just constantly working on his gut, giving him probiotics, making sure that he didn't eat or drink a lot of sugary foods and, and high carbohydrate laden diet. So, and you also we've got the vitamins and minerals too, which is also makes up a general supplement mm -hmm. list typically, and you know that gets into you know as we know just general you know biochemical support within the brain, the nervous system, the mitochondria, our energy, all of that, you know? So again, it kind of goes back to the filling in those gaps nutritionally. One of the things that comes up, Lori, and I know that you have some information on your website, but it's that whole thing of my child won't take the supplements or they don't taste good or they, they, you know, how, how do you go about giving? And we could obviously do a whole other talk on this, but um, any tips or suggestions, a few things off, off the top that you can think of, you know, maybe what you did, you know, some general recommendations as far as how to get kids to take supplements. Well, I did, I mean, I did all the wrong things at first and I learned from it and I wrote a, an article that you can find on my website called getting supplements into children. Okay. And, um, it, it basically points out that as a mom, you have to be Abs or a dad, you have to be absolutely determined that you are going to do this. And one of the things that I tell parents is if your son or daughter ingested a poison and they were going to be dead in a, a, an hour, but you had the antidote, which tasted horrible, would you find a way to get it in them? And of course, they all say yes. I said, that's the attitude. <laughs> it's a little extreme, but sometimes you have to make points with the extreme analogies, but you have to you have to understand that if you want your child to get well, you can't let the choice of whether they take a supplement that they need, that their brain needs, that their body needs to function optimally. You can't let them decide based on how it tastes. You have to, you have to be determined and you have to persevere and find a way to do it. And my experience with my own son was that they know when you are not going to, you know, it's like, nope, you're taking this and not, please take this <laughs> because they're smart enough, whether they have autism or not, they're smart enough to know when there's weakness and they try to capitalize on it and they want to win. But he knew, I mean, the first time I have to admit, I, I held him down and um, and wouldn't let him get away and found a way to get it down. And, but that's not what you want to do long term. So you have yeah. to come up with a plan. But he knew that I was serious. And so that article I wrote talks about finding the right method that's, that works for your child. Do they like crunchy? Do they 
Do they like uh, soft foods? Do they like, you know, what is their favorite ways of, of taking one of their favorite foods? And you find a way to get it in them and you uh, reward them for doing it. And when they don't, you take away something that they like to do and they, there's an immediate consequence. So it's like Daniel would be watching his morning cartoons and I would give him his supplements. And we used to give them in baby food peaches because they were really tart and they hit a lot of stuff. So I would say, it's time for your peaches. And he would go, no. Yeah. And so I'd walk over and calmly, wasn't going to be a battle. And I would just switch the TV off and I'd go, first you take your peaches, then you can watch to you. And he would go, mm. <laughs> and I just would, I wouldn't give in first your peaches, then you can watch your TV. And then, so he eventually said, okay, I'll do it because he wanted it. So you use almost like behavioral techniques to do it. But yeah. if you think through it, you get a plan you can you can win on this and you're able to get anything down because the reality is it's not everything is going to taste good. There's going to be something you have to give them that's going to taste awful and you just find a way to do it and then they start getting well and it's worth it. You know, I I look back, I think about just neurotypical kids. I think about myself, right? In that, you know, as a parent, when I was a kid or with my parents or as a father now, you know, with a neurotypical child, you, you still have to have discipline because they're not typically not going to want to do their homework or not want to do their chores or not want to eat this or that because, and, you know, it really does come down to that. And I remember I had some interesting experiences over the years with parents with very severe autistic uh, uh, children, you know, and some really, you know, profound taskmasters. I mean, they, you know, they were very disciplined and it was never easy. And I imagine it's never easy. And there's a lot of stress and I'm sure anxiety and guilt and some of these things that, that any parent in your position would feel. And, and that's my next question and, and is the parent, right? We've talked about the kids. We clearly know that there's issues. The numbers keep going up, you know, and I don't see that really ending, unfortunately. But one of the things that I've also recognized, and I've talked with you about this and other parents, is taking care of yourself. So what are some recommendations that now as you look back over the years that parents can do to take care of themselves? Because again, this is the long haul, right? This isn't just for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. So I've seen a lot of parents crash and burn. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a devastating thing for that to happen. So any recommendations you have for a parent out there to take care of themselves? Well, I've been there where you're so stressed and you're taking care of everyone else, but you are eating as a mom, you know, we treat, we, we barely eat. We don't eat healthy. We just eat along the way. And I've been encouraging moms to not only eat healthy, you know, Eat the gluten dairy free diet with your child. You know, it's a good diet. People feel better because gluten and dairy are inflammatory foods. And so, inflammation is a key to so many of our chronic health issues. So, eating well, taking supplements is another one. I know it's hard when you're spending so many supplements on your kid and you're like, ah, oh, this is so expensive, but they need to also take stuff for them to help them have the energy and the ability to, to fight off the, the, the sickness and the viruses that are coming around. When you are stressed and you are depleted, you're going to get sick. And we know that when mom's not doing well, nobody in the family does well, right? So it's one of those things that you have to take care of yourself. And also, not every mom has this ability, but to get time away, you know, to have somebody come and give them respite and they can get away and, and be by themselves or have a couple hours out with friends. Again, that's complicated and that's not an easy solution. But yeah. one of the things that that they have to remember is is whatever it takes, whatever they need to do to recharge and to keep themselves healthy, that has to happen. And one of the things I want to make sure is to put a shout out to the fathers too, because it's not just the moms, it's the dads. Really? And I've had, I've had, you know, uh, patients in my practice where it was the dad that was the primary 
caretaker. They were, it was either a, a divorce situation or the mother was not involved, didn't want to be involved. So, you know, by and large, it's moms, but the dads out there too need to understand that this information applies to them too. And there's plenty of fathers who are fighting this fight, you know, along with the moms. And I've, I, seen, I, I've seen grandmothers also. Yeah, the one exactly. Doing well. That's right. Yeah, I've had, I've had that too. Um, and I am in absolute agreement with you about all of it, right? Rest, recovery, supplements, healthy foods, exercise consistently, and then time away as much as possible. And I've actually written prescriptions in my practice to one of the other significant others, you know, to say, you know, your wife or your husband, whoever, um, this is a prescription for them once or twice a week to go out with a coffee with a friend or go to the mall and go shop, whatever it is, just some kind of break um, is extremely helpful. So, so Lori, I know we're coming to the end here. Um, any, any last recommendations, you know, um, things that you can think about, words of encouragement that you can give a new parent out there or maybe a parent that's been struggling with this for many years who is sort of new to this world or at their wit's end, you know, with um, not really sure where to turn, you know, what, uh, what, you know, last little pieces of advice can you give? Well, that's a really broad <laughs> question you just <laughs> asked me. So, um, you know, the reality is, is that this is a really overwhelming journey to take. And it's not one that's easy. It's not one that you can easily do on a budget. You don't always have support from doctors that you see or your, your in-laws or your friends around you. And, but it's something that I have to tell you, going down the biomedical journey for autism, treating children, their underlying issues is the only hope there is for this child to have as normal life as possible. Not every parent that goes through this with their child is going to get the same response I got with Daniel. And there's lots of reasons for it. Um, perhaps Daniel didn't have as much injury to begin with. Maybe it's because I started so early and aggressively. I don't know, but there are kids out there that are 16 years of age starting something and seeing benefit that are life-changing um, in terms of a parent being able to take a child on vacation and not have them melt down. Uh, have them be able to focus and function better in school and not get thrown out because of behaviors. All of these things can be helped by things like diet, supplements, detoxification, treating the GI tract. It affects the brain. And if you can go in, and even if you can only do one thing at a time, start that one thing at a time. And do the very best you can and, and trying to help that child and get the support you need. And, and one of the things I want to say is reach out to us. I, I'm in this for the reason of really caring about these kids and helping people get well. And so one of the things New Beginnings offers is we you can email me and, you know, and I can lead you or guide you in a way to get started, to, to help you get on the path and support you the very best way I can. Obviously, there's limitations, but I want to be available to that mom or that dad out there that's really struggling and just needs the information, the help to say, what do I do first? And, and so we have a lot of resources for you that I'd love for you to, to reach out to me if you feel like you need to. Um, and so anyway, just there's hope for these kids and autism is treatable and yeah. it doesn't matter what age they are. When you find out about this, don't put away the guilt and just get started and, and do the best you can and reach out for help because we all need help and support. And the better, the more you're doing it, the longer you do it, the easier it's going to get. And I guarantee you that it becomes less overwhelming 
as you walk down the road and you start getting comfortable with the routines and the changes that you're making in your child's life and in their routine or diet, et cetera. I would 100% agree. It's, it, you know, autism is treatable. There's hope and help. And it, anybody at any age can be helped, you know, by this, you know, this health pursuit. So Lori, as we wrap up, where can people contact you? You know, what's your website? Um, how can people reach out? So um, the, the website is uh, nbnus.net. It stands for New Beginnings Nutritionals, US, United States.net. That's the website. If you go onto the website, it says contact us, and you can send an email and say, you know, I have a question for Lori. You know, can she contact me and give me your email address or write your question in and I will get back to you? So that is how you get hold of us. And um, I'm more than happy to do what I can and to even, you know, make some recommendation from practitioners that could help you along the way to get started and to get some testing done. That's so important to get you know, to find out what's underlying for your child, because what was my child's issues may not be your child's issues. So you need to find exactly what is going on so you can start attacking the problems one by one. That's great. So, and also NBNUS, I believe you can get there through .com. So New Beginnings Nutritionals is the company NBNUS.net or .com. And then you have an email. I think you also on your website, you have that article you wrote too, right? So uh, yes, yeah, so, so go to the resources tab. Okay. And there's a there's a couple of cool things on the resources tab. There's something called webinar library, and there's a webinar library about different recorded webinars. And one that was recently done by me and um, a coworker, a friend who also has a recovered child, and we did a recovery is called a tale of two autism recoveries. And so feel free to go in and, and, and ask for that webinar link to be sent to you. And you will learn a lot more detail than what I've been able to share, which will help you understand. And you'll go, Oh, my kid does that. You know, maybe that's my issue. And it, we share a lot more underlying problems and things that, that, are going on with our kids and things that both Terry and I, the other mom, did to help our sons get well. So I would really encourage you to do that. And there's other webinars in there you could look at that maybe you might be interested in. My article, Getting Supplements into Children, you can find there under the resources tab. And there's also some um, some other videos, uh, a compelling story of recovery, a video I did when Daniel was 16 that was one of my talks. So anyway, you can find good resources there just to start with. Excellent. Well, Lori, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me in this program. Thank you, Kurt. I appreciate you having me on. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Doc Talk podcast with Dr. Kurt Wohler. For more information about this podcast, go to functionalmedicinedoctalk.com.